Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started today. We are very lucky to have the Honorable uh, Judge Janice McKenzie Cole. Uh, Mrs. Judge Cole is um, highlighted in our newest exhibit, Women Breaking Barriers in Northeastern North Carolina. And we have invited the Honorable Judge Cole so today so that she can just talk about the barriers that she has ever come through her entire life in order to make some of the the accomplishments she has today. So Judge Cole, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, good afternoon. Um, thank all of you who are on this uh, Zoom meeting. Appreciate you being interested enough to uh, in who I am to be able to uh, Zoom in. Uh, I want to thank uh, Museum of the Album All for the opportunity to share my experiences with, um, with this audience. As far as breaking barriers, I guess I'm here because I've been a first a few times over uh, as a first woman sometimes, sometimes as a first African-American, sometimes as a first African-American woman. I don't think that they have been able to figure out yet through our DNA, you know, what we will achieve in life, which of us will break barriers and which won't. But as I look back on my life and kind of reflect on it, I think some of the early signs were that um, I was, I always wanted to be different, never wanted to be in the crowd. I can remember being in middle school and I went to band for the first time. And they asked us all to select instruments. I didn't know anything about instruments at that time, not much anyway. But I saw that all the other girls were selecting the clarinet and the flute and maybe the saxophone. So of course I had to be different. I wanted to play the trumpet so I could be with the guys. Um, obviously I didn't become a first of anything playing the trumpet but I think it was just a sign of how I wanted to be different than others who I thought were like me. I think another sign might've been that I was never afraid to be the lone person or to be alone. I didn't have to travel in a pack. I didn't need others to, to be around me or to reinforce who I was or what I wanted to do. And I mean, even as a, an adult, people say, oh, you go to the movies by yourself? Yeah. Oh, you go to the restaurants and eat by yourself? Yeah. Oh, you travel by yourself? Yeah. And so I think that was just all part of things that, characteristics of mine that led to me accepting some of the challenges that have come my way. I don't think that you can travel in a pack and be the leader or be able to break barriers. And I also remember there were always magazines around my house as I was growing up. My parents subscribed to Ebony Magazine. They subscribed to Jet Magazine. If there are any on the call who were too young to know what they are, um, Jet was a, both of them were uh, African-American magazines that had a national distribution. Jet was a weekly magazine, Ebony was a monthly magazine. And it always highlighted the African-Americans who were doing things in high positions. And I used to read it on a regular basis and often thought, gee, it would be nice if I could be in, you know, there one day. Almost more like a passing thought than anything. But as I look back on my career, I think that there are three things primarily that I would say um, have gotten me to the point where I was breaking barriers. And I think that with preparation, uh, opportunity, and then the courage. I think that's probably the three things that had the most to do with it. When I started college, um, I went for a year and a half and then I dropped out. I was out for about six years before I went back. And in the meanwhile, they were giving the police officer exam in New York and it was a it was open to both men and women. There had been a lot of 
research and studies that had been done about whether or not women could really perform the job as men did. Up until that point, women were used to watch children or to guard female prisoners. And finally, the studies had shown that there was no reason why women could not do the job also, that it was not necessarily a job of strength, that women could often diffuse a situation that men being macho were not able to. They finally got police officers' wives to calm down about the fact that their husbands might be riding around all day in a police car with a woman. And so they opened up this exam for uh, men and women. And I decided that I wanted to take it because a police officer, well, gee, you know, that was different. <laughs> so I took the exam and then eventually become a police officer in New York. I was in one of the first groups of women to uh, be assigned to street patrol, just as the men were. And they divided us up so that we went to different precincts in pairs. And so me and uh, someone who's still a very close friend of mine to this day, we went and um, broke down the barrier to the precinct in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, New York. And that was an experience, but again, it gave me an opportunity to be a first. The, for the first time in the history of New York in 1973, there was a fiscal crisis and they laid off civil service workers and police officers were laid off as well. Well, of course, the women being the last hired were the first fired. And we were laid off after having been there for you know two or three years and that layoff ended up being for about um, two years. By the time they were ready to call the women back, I had completed college, I had gone back to college and completed that at night and had, was ready to start law school. So I decided not to go back. And so my next um, challenge was law school. As I indicated, I was an evening student. So it was four years for me instead of three. But I was determined at that point, I was really ready. I had always wanted to be a lawyer. Even when I dropped out of college, a lot of the jobs that I did were legal related, like the police officer, legal secretary, all those sort of things. And um, I even took up the stenotype machine, which is the one that you see the court reporters do in the courtroom. I did all those things, but I was determined and felt that a lawyer was what I always wanted to be. I, always wanted to be in the courtroom uh, presenting cases to juries and was not going to go in the courtroom in the back door. I wanted to go in the front door. So law school, here I came. I attended at night and Saturday and Sunday, I was just glued to my dining room table studying, doing what I had to do to, to make it through. I um, was riding the subway home from law school eight, nine, maybe 10 o'clock at night sometimes um, during the week. And then, like I said, Saturday and Sunday, that was all I did. <clears throat> but I was um, successful and completed law school. When I came out of law school, I, or as when I was in my senior year, there were two great opportunities that were offered to me. One that was um, in the office of the district attorney in Manhattan, <coughs> excuse me, and the district attorney's office in Manhattan is probably the most prestigious uh, district attorney's office in the country. And the other was as an assistant U.S. attorney, which would have been as a federal prosecutor. And to be able to come out of law school and go straight into a uh, federal um, assistant U.S. attorney position was just unheard of. But again, going back to what I said about preparation, opportunity, and courage, let me uh, just explain that while I was in law school and working, I saw that there was an opportunity to do an internship during the summer at the U.S. attorney's office in Brooklyn. And as I said, I had a full-time job, but I wanted to do it just so that I would have that exposure, have that experience. I didn't know what I was ever gonna do with it. 
So I spoke to my employer and asked if I could have those two months off without pay and they agreed. And I worked and I saved my money for about six months before so that I would be able to pay my bills during that time while I did this. They might've been a stipend, but they weren't sure. So I had to be prepared. So I did prepare myself. I went and I did that internship. It worked out well. I was assigned to one of the uh, attorneys and worked with them, went into the courtroom with them when they went into court, did everything they did. Little did I know that that exposure would give me the opportunity to get a job offer from the US Attorney's Office when I was coming out of law school. And like I said, to be able to go straight into a federal uh, prosecutor position like that, come out of law school is almost unheard of. But again, in preparing myself, you know, many of the things that we do, we just don't know how they might pay off down the line. And so many times when I am speaking to young people, I try to explain that to them. Um, the sacrifice that I had to make to save up my money to be able to pay my bills. Um, you know, those are things that sometimes when you're talking to young people, they just don't hear you. They just don't understand. But in the end, look at how it paid off for me. And it also, so the preparation was there. The opportunity was there. Um, I was just being myself, but obviously conducted myself in such a way when I was there that those who had an opportunity who were at the top and had an opportunity to observe me thought enough of my performance, plus with my background as a police officer and all, um, that they offered me a position. And so I went into the US Attorney's Office where I think is the best job that any attorney can have. When you get into private practice, you're so overwhelmed with the amount of cases that you have to do and stuff that it's sort of like just a survival thing. But as an assistant US attorney, you have, first of all, the best training through the US Department of Justice. Your caseload is manageable and you are able to take as much time as you can to prepare a case. Um, you do it often through the grand jury. You're working with the best of offices, FBI, Secret Service, you know, Drug Enforcement Agency. And it was really the vision that I always had of being an attorney. But after a few years of doing that, <clears throat> I was kind of a, you know, where do I go from here? What's next with my career? By that time, I had met my husband, uh, J.C. Cole, who worked as a federal agent, as a postal inspector. And I had come to Elizabeth City with him, visiting his family many times, and noticed that there were no female attorneys practicing in this area at that time. And this was in the early 80s. So people think that he brought me to the area, but he says I really brought him back because when he left, he had no intentions of ever returning. But I saw it as an opportunity. It wasn't so much that I wanted to be a first just for the sake of being a first, but I felt that being a first was, had an economic um, advantage to it because certainly I felt that there were people who would be happy to be able to bring their cases to a woman. And to my surprise, I was surprised at the amount of even male clients that I got in family matters who were tied up in divorces or child custody cases with their wives and thought that they had a better chance if a woman was representing them <laughs> than if another man. So I came, I practiced and the practice, you know, flourished. I was here, like I said, initially as the only woman um, that lasted maybe about eight, nine months before another female came into the district attorney's office, but I was out there in private practice. And it was interesting because I had a case before one of the chief, uh, the chief judge in district court, and it had to do with real estate. And I don't know, you know, he really took me seriously. Here we have this, you know, young woman practicing in an area where they weren't used to seeing women practicing. And he ruled against me in a matter that I just 
couldn't understand why he did. I felt the Lord was on my side. I felt that I was right. And having, again, come out of the best training you could have as an attorney, having written my appellate briefs for the Second Circuit um, Court of Appeals, Federal Court of Appeals, I felt that uh, I would just take the time and go ahead and appeal to the North Carolina Court of Appeals, his decision. I don't even think my client could afford to pay me at that time, but um, to me, it was the principle of it. So I went ahead and did that appeal and sure enough, the judge was overturned. Well, I think I got a little bit of respect behind that. So when I stood up before that judge again or the other district court judges and started making my arguments, at least they listened. I don't think that they kind of dismissed me just because, you know, this woman from New York, what does she know? But as I practiced, I practiced for about seven years and lo and behold, here comes opportunity again. Uh, that same judge was retiring from the bench. So it was an open seat and it's always easier to run for an open seat than to run against an incumbent. So there were many people who were interested in the seat and wanted to throw their hats in the ring. I hadn't really thought about it much, but a friend of mine suggested that I do it. And I said, gee, me run for judge? You know, how am I gonna do that? In this area that for the most part, you know, I'm seven years, but people don't really know me and seven counties were involved. But the opportunity was there because the seat was open. And then talking again about um, preparation I had, I guess, always been a little interested in politics. And when I was in New York, I was very active in politics. I had belonged to um, what we at that time had political clubs as they were called. And so I was very active in many elections and saw how it was done, knew how to canvas, knew how to get out, talk, meet people and so on. So I had that background behind me to run an election here, which was probably more sophisticated than most of the elections that they had seen in our area at that time. In addition to that, I'm a service oriented person. And so I joined many things when I got here. I belonged to many organizations. I was on several boards, <coughs> excuse me. I was on several boards, many of them which involved women, uh, issues like Hope Line, Food Bank, all those sort of things. I just, I just did because service is what I do. So when the time came for me to run, I had many of these groups that were behind me supporting me that were going to help me and what I needed to do. And again, it's about preparation. You know, sometimes we prepare for things. And, I mean, I just believe in taking advantage of opportunities. It doesn't mean that you can always see how it's going to pay off or that it is going to pay off. But it is, um, you just never know. And when you do things and you do it for the right reason, you know, who, who knows how it might help you down the road. The fact that I had been a police officer helped me because as I ran for judge, because you know there were many who feel that, oh, well, a minority is gonna give away the courthouse. So they're going to be lenient on, on criminals. And um, you know, here I came with a police officer background. So, you know, that stereotype kind of went out the window. I um, remember speaking to one of the prominent African-Americans in this area, when I say this area, I mean, you know, east of 95, about my interest in running and being told, oh, well, you know, you're not going to be able to get that because uh, he looked at the computer and he put his numbers in and he told me how many African-American voters there were and, um, you know, there weren't enough of me to be able to win in this seven county area. And again, it was a mindset of African-Americans only vote for African-Americans and whites only vote for whites. 
And there was probably a lot of truth to it at that time. I guess there's probably still a lot of truth to it, but I wasn't willing to accept that. I had participated in, in many of these organizations, like I said, where again, I wasn't afraid to be alone. So the fact that I might've been the only black woman sitting at the table didn't bother me. Um, it was interesting to see how sometimes other African-Americans would make comments about, well, I don't wanna join that because there are no other blacks there, you know, that sort of thing, but that wasn't me. So I was in a lot of organizations where I was working with black women, white women, and they were going to, because they knew me and they knew um, who I was, what I did, uh, how I thought, they were willing to support me. And that they did. We had fish fries. They helped me address envelopes. We sent letters. Um, I knocked on doors and did registrations. I can remember some of the older women would sit downstairs in my van and I would go in some of the housing developments and knock on doors and people weren't invited. If they weren't um, registered, I would invite them to go downstairs and, and get registered because the person in the van could fill out the uh, application for them. It used to be a joke uh, where some people would say if more than uh, two Democrats would, were joined together, then I was there. There were candidates forums all over. At that time, I don't know if you know how many townships are in Curry Tuck. Um, I see you, Test Judge. I know you know how many townships there are in Currituck. And each one of them would have a candidate's forum. And I would have to go to each one of them. I'd be riding the roads at night. Um, me, a New Yorker, you know, riding these back roads at night. But again, you know, once I set my mind to something, nobody can outwork me. You know, you might be smarter, you might be this, you might be that, but you can't outwork me if I make up my mind that I want to try and do something. So, the preparation was there, the background was there, I did the work. It was a four-way race. I was running against three white males uh, in that primary. And in order to, what used to happen was that you had to get 50% of the vote in order to avoid a runoff. And the legislature had just reduced it to 40% um, because that became quite an obstacle for minorities. They would often come in um, high as one of the top two vote getters in races around the area, but around the state. But once they were thrown into a runoff, um, then the white candidate would be able to garner more votes. So they had lowered it to 40%. And I had to get at least 40% not to get into a runoff. And sure enough, I worked hard enough that I got my 40%. So there was no runoff. And then I went on to win in the general election against a Republican opponent. And that was how I became the first woman, uh, the first African-American to sit as a judge in this seven county area. But the truth of the matter is I was probably the only woman sitting from here to, the only other female judges I can think of were in Fayetteville or on the other side of Rocky Mount. And when I did get on the bench in 1990, there were quite a few women who had been elected around the state, but not our area. So I was able to take advantage of the opportunity, the preparation was there. And then I had the courage to run. A lot of people just don't have the courage to run for elected office. And it certainly wasn't even as bad then as it is now, as far as um, you know how candidates are treated and your personal information and all of that. But I had the courage to run. And so it paid off for me and I became a judge. I was the only woman who had won in this you know, general area in a regional race. There were other women who maybe had been successful in their counties, but once you started crossing county lines, I was a first. 
to the point where when Eva Clayton was running for Congress and eventually was elected as the first woman um, Congresswoman, African-American co Congresswoman from North Carolina, she even came to sit down and talk to me about you know, my philosophy and how did I do it and how did I approach it? Because again, there just were not other models of women who had run uh, in a regional race across county lines who had been successful. I was on the bench for about three years and then knock, 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 here comes another opportunity. A uh, Democrat was elected as president. That was President Clinton. And the US attorney position, positions are all um, political positions. You're appointed by the president. And someone has suggested to me that I put my name in the hat for that. And I can remember speaking with one of the African-American judges who was on the Court of Appeals at the time uh, and asking him what he thought about it. And again, being discouraged, told that, um, oh, well, that's entirely too political for you. You wouldn't be able to get that. Why don't you try for something like the Court of Appeals? But of course, you know, I was not to be discouraged. <laughs> the preparation was there. I had the law enforcement background. I had been an assistant U.S. attorney in New York, and I was a judge at that time. Now, again, because of how things were being done in North Carolina at that time, especially in the Eastern District, which covers from Raleigh to the coast, there are 44 counties all in all. There had only been one African-American who had previously served as an assistant U.S. attorney in that office. And that was the other person who had ended up um, being the finalist for that position with me. I was the outsider. And there certainly seemed to have been a feeling I, among the African-Americans that they had worked long and hard in the state to get opportunities. And that once something became available that they felt it should go to one of them, one of their own and not to you know this woman who just flew in the state from, North, from New York. So I didn't have a lot of support among that group, but Eva Clayton um, was the a con Congresswoman from my area and was very happy to promote me. It was a situation which is similar to what we have now in that you have a Democratic president, but you don't have a Democratic Senator in the state because usually the Senator will make that recommendation to the president. In this situation, it fell then to the congressional representatives, those in the House, to be able to make recommendations. And um, I did have the support of Eva Clayton, but I also had the background that I had, and I had the courage to go for it. Um, it was a long, arduous process, but again, I was successful. And that allowed me to become the first African-American and the first African-American woman to serve as a presidentially appointed United States attorney um, in the state. There had been a African-American male who had served in the Carter administration in the middle district. And there had been a woman who had served previously in my district, the Eastern District, um, who had taken over after her husband, but I was the first African-American woman to serve as a um, United States Attorney, uh, presidentially appointed United States Attorney, to the point where the other person who had been considered had a friend who wrote a letter to the News and Observer complaining that the only reason I got it was because I was a woman, which was really kind of a joke in that, you know, like I said, I mean, who else had the background as an assistant US attorney except for this one guy? Who else had the background in law enforcement that I had? Who else had been a judge? So I think it fell on deaf ears, but that was the kind of opposition that I was up against. And those who felt that, um, 
this position should not have gone to me who after seven years, almost 10 years at that point was still viewed as you know, an outsider. So for seven years, I served as the US attorney. And um, when you are in a political position like that and you're appointed by the president, when people want to get at the president, they come for those who serve for the president. And so it was not the easiest seven years of my life, or at least certainly the first three or four were not the easiest. Um, I went into an office that had been a stronghold of, um, and when I say stronghold, I meant that, you know, the people who had been hired in the office were very much uh, part of a conservative network here in the state. And at that time, I would say out of maybe some 20 attorneys, 20, 20 30 attorneys, maybe three or four at most were women. Uh, one was an African-American male. And um, I think one of the strongest and best things that I was able to do in that office was to be able to open the door to many others. And to me, that's what breaking barriers is all about. You know, the fact that I've been able to hold some of these titles as the first of this or the first of that really doesn't amount to a hill of beans if I'm also the last. And so the goal is to open the door for others to be able to come behind me. And I've tried to do that throughout all that I've done. Um, mentoring seems to be something that um, maybe I have a natural gift for uh, because people do flock to me for mentoring. Not that I necessarily um, think of myself as a mentor, but I'm always willing to help. And if I see anybody trying to do something, I certainly am happy to step out and help them if I see a way that I can. So by the time I left that office, um, about half of the office were female attorneys. About a third of the office were African-American attorneys. And I counseled them. Um, I didn't want them to be in the same position as the one or two who had been there before because again, they felt isolated and they eventually left the office. I explained to people that I hired and especially African-American women you know, I'm hiring many of you so that you all can be here to support each other. As the administrations change, you're gonna be under a lot of pressure in this, these offices. And this is something that was new to me because I can tell you in New York, the offices were not as politicized as they are as I found them to be here in North Carolina. As assistant US attorney, I didn't know whether the US attorney was a Democrat or a Republican. And when it changed, when the parties changed, it didn't make a difference in the office. Business went on as usual. People hired you. They didn't ask you whether you were a Democrat. They didn't ask you whether you were a Republican. They were just interested in your credentials. When I got to North Carolina, I found that that was very, very different. So I knew that many of the people that I hired were going to be under great pressure um, as the administration changed and I counseled them about being able to stay there, be support for each other. And so, you know, I'm proud to say that several of them are still there. Some of them are supervisors. Some of them have been seriously considered for federal judgeships, um, seriously considered for some of the upcoming US attorney positions that are now um, open again with the change of president. So to me that that's a, that's an accomplishment. The fact that I made it is great. Um, and I'm proud of that and happy, but the importance of it is how it positioned me to be able to do and open doors for others who looked like me. After leaving the US Attorney's Office, um, and by the way, when I became US Attorney, um, I did end up in an article in Ebony Magazine, <laughs> the same national magazine that I used to read as a kid and say that, uh, gee, it'd be nice if I'd be in there one day. Well, when I became US attorney, they did an article on some of the female African-American US attorneys that had been appointed by President Clinton. And so I did get my wish. I did end up in Ebony Magazine. After leaving the US attorney's office, it was like, ooh, what do I do now? Um, and again, even just that had a lot of, you know, 
it was an easy. I, my office was in Raleigh. My staff was in Raleigh. I could have worked out of the courthouse in Elizabeth City, but I felt I needed to be where the staff was. So every Monday morning, I left home, drove to Raleigh. I had an apartment there, stayed there during the week. And then Friday night, I would drive back home, be home Saturday and Sunday, and then be gone again. Um, a lot of women wouldn't be prepared to do that, but I did. And when the time came to leave that office, there were probably many opportunities that would have been available to me if I was willing to continue that sort of a schedule or go to Washington or whatever. But my husband was here. He was a, he had stepped into my seat as a district court judge at that time. So we couldn't just pick up and leave the area, nor did we want to. And so I pretty much resolved myself to the idea that whatever I did, I would come back and do it here. Another opportunity opened unexpectedly. Eva Clayton decided that she was gonna step down from Congress and people encouraged me to run. And I eventually did, I was not successful. But interestingly, the opportunity was there. Yes, I had the courage to step out and do it but the preparation wasn't there. I didn't go into the US attorney with the thinking that I was going to, you know, use that as a, you know, jump off to my next job as many US attorneys do. And if I had, if I thought I was ever gonna run for Congress, there's a lot of things I would have done. I would have spent a lot of time in those 44 counties on weekends, meeting, greeting people, you know, doing those sort of things, but that wasn't my plan. Plus I had a husband who was only seeing me two days a week anyway. And so it, it never even dawned on me to do that. So when the time came and I did put myself out there to run for Congress, in my mind, the preparation had not been done and I was not successful. Two years later, the person who had won was on his way to jail and um, there was an opportunity to run again. But by then I had done a lot of self-analysis and I realized that everything that people encourage you to do, everything that's supposed to be that next step for you to do is not necessarily what is best suited for you. And you really, really have to think about it. If I jumped up tomorrow and said, gee, I should run for whatever, I'm sure I would have 50 people who would say, go for it, Janice, go for it. But they don't know the wear and tear um, what it puts on you, uh, what is, what's involved. And when I really gave it some serious thought, I says, I, I don't belong in Congress. My personality doesn't fit Congress. By the time they told me that uh, you need to go raise some money for us because uh, we need to do this, that, or the other, if you want to get on this committee or that committee, I would have said, what? <laughs> you know, and by the time I got through, I would not have been able to bring anything back to my district, I guess, because I would have been ostracized, but it didn't suit me. And so I always say I'm thankful that God doesn't give me everything I asked for. And so I did not win when I ran for Congress because people see you now and they think that everything, that, you know, that you have a Midas touch that because of my background that, you know, everything that I did turned to gold. Well, that's not true. There are many things that I did try for that were not successful. That was one of them. And I decided that I was gonna come back. And um, after that race, I still had to determine what I wanted to do. There were many areas of the law that I didn't wanna do anymore because I figured, you know, been there, done that. And always wanted to be different. I realized that there was a need for, uh, immigration attorneys and there were none in the area. So sure enough, that's what I'm gonna do then. I'm gonna become an immigration attorney and founded my law practice, Cole Immigration Law. And you know, that's what I've been doing. I've called myself semi-retired at this point. I've closed my offices. I am call myself, you know, just finishing out cases that I had started which with immigration could be five or six years. So I have slowed down, not as much still as I would like to, but, uh, but I'm on my way. But I continue, and in the meanwhile, I served as a county commissioner. 
Um, I did that for about six and a half years. I started out filling a vacancy of someone who had um, died in office and then uh, was elected to the position. Um, that was also interesting and something that I think, I, I hope I made a difference. I hope I had an impact while I was there. Um, there are those who claim that I mentored them while I was there. And many times I've been recognized for mentoring and really almost to my surprise, because to me, I'm just doing what comes natural. One of my fellow commissioners started a scholarship fund with the Clemens County Schools for me because of the mentoring that I had done. And he felt that I always mentored him. Uh, the North Carolina Bar Association Youth Division uh, gave me an award for my assistance of young lawyers. Um, my law school has given me citizenship awards because of the sort of service that I've done. So I guess mentoring just kind of in my DNA. I had um, spent some time doing online courses, training as a, a coach. And to me, that's probably the most important thing that I do and I still do. I mean, people call me often um, for my advice and I'm happy to give it, always happy to, to, to help. Um, I'm a firm believer that advice is just that people have a right to take it or leave it. And so I try not to be overbearing, but what I've learned, I'm happy to share with others. And my value, I think, is based on what I have been able to do for others, share with others, open doors, and bring others up with me and behind me. Okay. Thank you so very much. Now we're um, we're going to open up for questions. So if anyone has a question for the Honorable Judge Cole, if you would type it into the Q and A, and we will get them answered. But I, what an inspiring story! Because, like you said, you haven't only broken barriers, but you've inspired others to move forward. And that that's. I've enjoyed the program today so very much. Thank you. So do we have any questions? Yes. Um, okay, so um, I have, okay, so I do have um, two questions. What the first question, what regrets, if any, do you have? I don't know that I have any. Um, I try not to look back. People often ask me which job did I like the best. You know, I enjoyed each one for different reasons when I was there. And, um, you know, everything that I've done has made me who I am. Every mistake that I've made has made me who I am, has helped me to grow. So I don't really have regrets. Okay. So our next question, can you talk about your parents, their backgrounds and how they inspired you to break new ground? Well, I'm, uh, let's see. I'm from West Indian um, heritage which was all part of what made me coming to North Carolina so interesting because I had had no exposure to the South, had never been in the South, um, knew nothing about it. And um, my father was uh, from Jamaica and he had come here as a teenager. My mother was born in New York City, but her family was from Antigua. Her mother was from Antigua and they were, you know, me and my sisters were first generation college graduates. But my father is probably one of the brightest people I ever knew. I mean, he could read books that to this day I can't. And he worked as a civil servant in New York. He started off as a sanitation worker in the subway system 
and eventually moved up to becoming a motorman, which um, a conductor, which is the one that you ride in New York subways, the person who's in the middle, who opens and closes the doors. And at that point, that was about as far as any African Americans had gone. He had studied and studied for the test to uh, rise to the position of motorman, the one who actually drove the train, and was able to score high enough that he was appointed. And then he eventually moved up to the position of um, a supervisor. And he was the first African-American to hold that position in the, in the New York subway system. So I certainly had that as a model as far as being a first and a hard worker. My mother was um, sort of the rock um, of the family. She always was. Um, she worked as a stenographer in the school system, what we would call um, here special ed. Okay, she worked in that department in the New York City school system. Um, also, just always encouraged us to, to do our best. Um, you know, she also was a self taught to, you know. She went further in school than my father did and eventually went to secretarial school and everything. But um, they just pushed us, encouraged us that we could do anything, that we could, you know, reach the sky. Uh, always told me when I was young that I should be a lawyer because I talked so much. So they were a great, great influence in my life and my sister's lives. And no doubt in my mind, I wouldn't be who I am had it not been for them. So our next, um, Mrs. Arlene Sutton, I applaud you and all that you have done. I noticed you mentioned opportunity several times. What would you have done in the early 20s when sometimes the opportunities are not there? You know, sometimes opportunities are there and we don't necessarily see them um, or we have to make them. So I mean, leadership is leadership. It may not be in the environment that we would like it to be, but leadership is still leadership. I mean, there are those who succeeded in the African-Americans and women who succeeded in the 1920s. So I believe I would have been there. I would have found an opportunity. Um, our next comment, can you comment on the state of race relations in America today? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, we don't have that much time left. Yes. <laughs> and I do have some more com uh, some more questions and comments too. So, um, Mrs. Avery Birch, hi, Judge Cole. As a woman graduating from law school this spring, congratulations, Avery. What are some ways that you think we can offer your legacy? And break, and break barriers in Eastern North Carolina? Well, one of the things would be to stay in Eastern North Carolina, which is especially difficult. You know, one of the reasons that I came here was because there, are not, there were not a lot of African-American attorneys when you looked at the whole number in the country. But what we tended to do was congregate in the larger cities. And as we see young people in this area go to law school, it's very, very hard for us to get them to then come back to these communities wanting to serve. And I understand it. I mean, there's not the social life that they might have in Raleigh or Durham or, or Greensboro or Charlotte, but there is a need. Um, you know, lawyers are the ones who move up and become judges. You know, judges are the ones who maybe go on and become something else. And if you're not here, then you're not positioning yourself to be able to do that sort of thing. So I think that we just cannot ignore our rural communities. The professionals cannot ignore our rural communities. You can become a star probably much faster in Northeastern North Carolina than you would if you were, if you're in Charlotte. And 
so often I have been asked to serve on boards, statewide boards and other positions because it's geographic. It's not only that they satisfy putting a woman on and they satisfy putting an African-American on, but also geographically it satisfies them having some rep representation from the rural community. So to anyone who's, who's getting out of law school now, um, Avery is, was it, was it Bunch, did you say? Burr. Avery? Burr. Burr. Okay. Um, Ms. Burr, I would say, give a lot of thought and consideration to um, coming back and serving the community that you live in, have been raised in. Okay. So Mrs. Jane King Robinson, thank you for the wonderful details you shared. Would you address specific opportunities you see for women and women of color interested in political offices in this continued and perhaps more politically polarized environment of today? It's about the courage and it's about the preparation. There are certainly positions to be run for, but you have to prepare and you have to have the courage to want to step out and run. And I don't think we're seeing enough of that. I don't think we see enough people who are willing to serve in public office. I mean, if you look around county commissions, we don't have many female county commissioners at all. Um, you know, maybe more on school boards, but, you know, even in our town council, we're the women, you know. So I think that the positions are there. I mean, the opportunity is there for women to run. Women just don't want to step out and, and you know, aren't showing the courage to run for these offices. Okay, uh, Mr. Paul Nelson, where did you get your undergraduate degree from and in what and where did you and where did you go to law school In what and where did you go to law school do you I need to repeat I messed no. up. <laughs> I think I got it. Okay. <laughs> I went to john Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, which is part of the City University of New York, and that's where I got my bachelor's degree and I got a master's degree in public administration from there. I went to Fordham School of Law for my law degree and actually completed my master's while I was attending law school at night. Okay, and I have a few in the chat session also. Yeah, normally I'm like, where are we gonna get questions from? So you have definitely um, inspired people today. I, um, I have known this amazing lady and her story is so inspiring. Uh, and the person had to jump off for just a moment. And let's see here, just awesome presentation, so inspiring. What barrier was harder to, harder to break, being a woman or being an African-American? Well, the interesting thing about it is sometimes you didn't know which barrier you were fighting. Um, you run into these obstacles and you're not quite sure, are they doing this to me because I'm a woman or are they doing this to me because I'm an African-American or perhaps both? So you just can't tell. You just can't tell all the time um, where, where people are coming from. And so therefore I can't say which was harder. Both of them were there, very evident. A lot of times I'm sure it was both. But um, whichever one I was fighting, it didn't matter. I was gonna go ahead, you know, as professional, as determined, as hardworking as I was to deal with it. And this comment's going to relate to you being a mentor. Judge Cole has been an inspiration and great influence in my life. I am more than grateful for her advice and support. So there you, you were talking about your mentoring today. So I think there goes your comment. Thank and you. Let's see, and if I knew who that would, um, I'm not sure exactly who made that comment. Um, our next chat. I, I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
um, our next chat. What is your advice to anyone aspiring to run for a political office when the abundance of money is required during this day and age? That's a wonderful question. <laughs> it is, and it's, um, it's the most distasteful part of running for public office. Uh, we don't see it so much in our area with regard to regards to the judicial positions, but with the other races, it's it, it's definitely an obstacle, and it's just it comes with the territory. It's just something that you have to be prepared to do, and nobody I don't know anybody who enjoys raising money. I guess some people get used to it after a while, but I think one of the things we have to learn is that if we want women to hold these offices, then we as women need to learn how to give. And so when you see people running for office, write a check for $100, you know? I mean, you spend that on, on anything else, why not give it to people to help them with their campaigns? We as women have to support women running and a lot of that support is financial. Okay. Um, but other than that, you've got to get on the phone, you've got to call, you've got to beg, and um, women need to learn how to give. And we have what I got, so I have one more comment in the chat session. Judge Cole is awesome, an inspiration to women everywhere. She is a blessing to this region and nationally as well. So that was our comment. So there we go again. You had, you, you broke barriers, but you've made a difference in northeastern North Carolina. And I'm, we have one more question. I had the opportunity to meet Judge J. C. Cole this summer, and this is my first time listening to your experience. Eastern North Carolina is very lucky to have you both. Thanks for your service. Thank you. So that was comment too okay so um if we no more chats and we have no i see no more questions coming through but again we would the honorable judge cole thank you so much for joining us today your your story is just inspirational um i think all young girls i mean even young men should hear that how you decided that you were gonna follow your own lead, not have to be in the pack with everybody else. And I think that's a story that we need a lot today for everyone to hear. Um, if, if you have not had the opportunity to visit the museum, the Honorable Judge Cole, she is in our exhibit, Women Breaking Barriers in Northeastern North Carolina, along with a lot of other women from the 13 counties that we represent here. So um, there's some truly inspiring stories throughout the exhibit. The museum's open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. We're hoping that if we can get past this COVID um, soon, that we'll be able to open for um, much longer hours. But again, thank you to everyone that has joined us today. Thank you to the Honorable Judge Cole. We are just grateful that you were able to share your story with everyone. And in fact, I would say we probably had close to 100 people online today for your talk. So we're excited for that. You should, again, it just shows your um, con contribution to the community because sometimes we don't get to that number. So thank you again. Thank you to everyone that joined us today. Have a great day. Thank you. And Lori, just let me encourage everybody to see that exhibit. It really is great. And it covers women from so many decades. So even if you're not from this area, you'll see people who, who, who are doing things now that are part of the exhibit. It really is worth seeing. And on the first floor is the artwork that was done by students. And that too, I think is very, very um, inspiring. Thank you. And actually, on February the 17th, we are having another History for Lunch, and we're going to have Mrs. Um, Caroline Stevenson and Mr. Um, I can see his name. Um, he's from the Discovery of Hartford County, and I, I, will, I must be getting 
all because I cannot remember. But um, we're going to have them. They're going to talk about Mrs. Katie Hart, who was from Hertford County, and she started a bookmobile for the people of Hertford County, so for African Americans, so that they could deliver, so that they could get books and not have to travel to the local library. So they are going to um, have that topic on February the 17th at 12 noon. And if you would like to sign up, we have that posted so that you can get registered for that event too. And Mrs. Hart, she is located in the Women's Break and Barrier exhibit too. So again, thank you to everyone today. We greatly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Stay safe. Remember three W's. <laughs>